Before I begin, I'd like to thank and congratulate uh, my colleagues on receiving the Good Neighbor Award. I feel very humbled to be counted as their member. They're great folks. I'd like to thank the National Association of Realtors, Lowe's, House Logic for honoring me with this award. And even more importantly, for providing $10,000 to the Center for Faith Justice along with the $2,000 Lowe's gift card. As you have seen in our video, this organization has a unique mission. It not only directly serves the poor and disadvantaged, but it also teaches young people the value of service. By awarding this generous grant to the Center for Faith Justice, you are investing in the future, one that guarantees that our next generation will include compassionate leaders and our communities will have even more good neighbors. I have been involved with the Center for Faith Justice since its inception, and I was drawn to it largely because of my own personal experiences. I grew up in East Brunswick, New Jersey, the oldest of seven children. In early 1976, my dad passed away when I was 13. My mom was left with the task of raising six young boys and a little girl all by herself. Being thrust into this new situation, a single parent household with six younger siblings, I thought I knew what it was like to make do, to be poor. Shortly after my dad had passed, things got tough. We needed to rely on public assistance for a short period of time to help feed our family. Our extended family, our neighbors, and our local faith community, and sometimes even strangers rallied around us. We always had a safe, warm place to live. We saw our family doctor and dentist on a fairly regular basis. We always had clean clothes, and there was always enough food on the table. We attended good Catholic schools where the nuns and the brothers were eager to help me and my brother stay in line. All the while, my mother was the perfect role model. Even though we always seemed to have just enough for ourselves, our kitchen table was the gathering place for friends and acquaintances throughout the years. There just always seemed to be plenty of macaroni to go around. It was a true loaves and fishes story. When I was a junior in high school, I was given a rare opportunity to spend a week in service in rural Kentucky with a group of my classmates. I'd never really seen poverty and hopelessness like I witnessed on this and subsequent return visits to Appalachia. On my first trip, our work group went to a very small farm located in a holler. For those of you who don't know, a holler is a valley between two mountains. <laughs> The farmer was named Ned Toll. Ned was about 65 years old, but he looked like he could have been 80. This, no doubt, the result of poor diet and chain-smoking cigarettes, a phenomenon that plagues the, the, a lot of the rural poor. Ned's farm, if you could call it that, consisted of a few dozen acres of ground, a barn that was barely a building, a rusty tractor, and a couple of tired plow horses no house. We'd come to find out that he and his wife, who had recently passed, raised ten children in a home that had been destroyed by the past winter's heavy snows. He took us through the field to the back of his property, where he showed us a small wooden shack that was once their home, literally built into the side of an old milk truck from the 1950s. Ned told us that the boys slept in the milk truck because, as he said, they was tougher than girls, and the girls and their mama slept near to the fire. These folks had no electricity, no gas, no running water, just the remains of a small outhouse about 50 feet from the dilapidated structure. Over the years, when they could afford them, they raised chickens for eggs, they had a single dairy cow, and grew a limited amount of vegetables, because after all, they needed to sell most of what they grew to pay for the farm, and other of life's um, necessities. They had also supplemented their foodstuffs by hunting small game in the local mountains and eating things that you and I wouldn't even dream of. After meeting him, I had come, come to understand the term dirt poor. My visit with Ned was over 35 years ago, and yet I'll never forget my initial thoughts. We live in America. How is this possible? 
Unfortunately, little has changed in that part of the country. As a result of this trip and other experiences like it, I began to mentally articulate a passion for helping those in need. But something was missing. In 2005, I joined a conversation with my friend Sean Sanford and some other close friends, which led us to form the Center for Faith Justice. The goal of the Center is to provide transformative experiences of faith by building community, serving those in need, and educating others for justice. Noted author C.S. Lewis once said, we are what we believe. The Center for Faith Justice affirms that very idea in the essential relationship between what we believe and how we live. If you'll notice, we join the words faith and justice into a single term to reflect our conviction that faith and justice are intimately bound together. Nearly every mainstream faith tradition recognizes that God calls us as individuals and as communities to act on behalf of the vulnerable, the weak, and the oppressed. At CFJ, we currently run three main programs, service works for middle schoolers, a more intense immersion program for high school students called Justice Works, and our Leader Works program for young adults, most often college students. This past summer, almost 900 students and staff completed close to 20,000 hours of community service throughout these three programs. Our goal is to provide assistance to our partner organizations while at the same time educating the students and staff on issues of social justice and why these issues must be a concern to people of faith. This can bring about meaningful change in the world. And we know our programs are effective because many of our participants have come back from their week of service and started their own social justice initiatives at their schools and in their communities. One recent example of this is a father and son team who went on Justice Works for, for the very first time last summer, traveling to Appalachia to help spruce up a school in a very poor rural community of West Virginia. They were moved by seeing not only the poor conditions and meager facilities at the school, but also by meeting the children at the school and realizing that just like kids everywhere, these kids had dreams for a future, and they just wanted an opportunity to achieve. They learned from the principal at Dunlow Elementary School that about 30% of her students were able to pass the state reading proficiency test. She showed them that one of the school's greatest needs was a proper library. Currently, the school's limited book selection is housed on shelves in the gym. They saw children trying to read over the din of other children taking PE classes at the same time. Some kids were literally getting hit in the back of the heads with dodgeballs while they were trying to concentrate on their reading. So as a result, this father and son team came home and started an ambitious project to raise $35,000 to erect a modular classroom that will be converted to a library for the school. And this is just one story of many I can tell you of students and students <coughs> who have come back from a week of service and applied the lessons they learned passion for justice they experience to solve the problems they see in and around them. This is our mission in action. With this $10,000 grant, we hope to expand our programs into Washington, D.C. and Chicago in 2014. I am, I am passionate about continuing our work of sowing the seeds for the future where there will be many more good neighbors. And I sincerely thank the National Association of Realtors, Lowe's, and House Logic for honoring me with this award and making this generous donation to the Senate.